All right, welcome to lecture 15.1. Today we're going to talk about exposing uh, non-contributing forces. All right, so recall that uh, non-contributing forces um, are not present when we formulate Gaines equations. These non-contributing forces, right, are um, these forces that are at frictionless contacts or at the rolling without slip contact or any uh, forces that act between two given points in a rigid body. So if you would like to know, like, what are the internal forces in a rigid body while it's ha in motion in this multi-body system, um, we may be interested in those. So you may be interested in calculating these, even though... Um, we eliminate them from the equations of motion in general. So you may want to know various distance or contact forces. Okay. And we can get a hold of those, um, or at least some equations for those. So we can get a hold of equations for any of these non-contributing forces in a multibody system by introducing something called an auxiliary generalized speed. So if you recall that generalized speeds are really the, and the partial velocities associated with them are generally the, uh, are the magic or the secret to getting a hold of Kane's equations. And uh, we can introduce some new speeds to actually, to our benefit, to expose some of these forces. So, um, forces and torques So forces and torques uh, that are defined in the same directions, or I would say force and torque components is probably more uh, appropriate, but forces and torques defined in the same directions of the associated, and I'll call these um, auxiliary partial velocities, right? So the partial velocities associated with these new speeds um, can be used to generate extra equations for these non contributing forces. So extra equations we need. Right. So that's the basic idea. All right, we're going to introduce some new generalized speeds, uh, but do so in a way that uh, exposes some of these uh, forces. So, uh, and I guess one way to recall this, we did the example that with the double pendulum that showed how the distance forces in the double pendulum would be eliminated. Um, but if we introduce some auxiliary generalized speeds in the directions of those distance forces and leave those in the equations, we can actually expose them. And, I, and we're going to use that as an example. Um, 
here to see how it's done, which I think will be the best way to show this. So we're going to have a simple double pendulum. And we're going to show how we don't have to necessarily eliminate these equations. All right, so let me sketch out a little pendulum. So we're going to keep it uh, simple here. Um, we'll have two particles of mass m held at a distance l from each other. And um, I'll call this point P1 or particle P1 and point or particle P2 um, on the second pendulum. And I'll introduce a couple of generalized speeds. So I want a straight line. So I'm going to measure both general, generalized coordinates. Um, I didn't mean the same speeds, but two generalized coordinates such that um, they're both measured from the vertical here. So we'll have a Q1 and a Q2. All right. Um, the I'll have two unit vectors here that represent the inertial reference frame in x and in y and then gravity will also be present acting downward on both of these uh, particles and I want to also I'll call that point O there which is going to be fixed in n All right. so just a basic simple double pendulum we've seen this before um, I will choose generalized speeds to be the simple definitions, like so. And then I should be able to now write um, the velocities of each uh, point of interest. So the particle or point one. Uh, and I'm going to write everything in terms of the in frame, and I'll use abbreviations here cosine of q1. Uh, in the in x direction plus sine of q1 in the in y direction. All right, so the velocity of p1, the velocity of p2 will be the velocity of p1 uh, plus a similar term, but now we'll have l u2 times c2 in x plus uh, sine of q2 in y. Right. So the two basic velocities, we've written them in terms of only the generalized speeds there. And then I can also write the accelerations. So we'll have a tangential and a um, centripetal component. So the tangential component looks like this. And the centripetal component will look like this. All right. And then the acceleration of P2 will be the acceleration of P1 plus similar terms, but with U2 instead. All right, so those are the velocities and accelerations, all written in terms of the generalized speeds and their derivatives. I can then write the partial velocities that we're going to need. Right, We're going to need the partial velocities of each of these two masses. So the first partial velocity of P1. By inspection, we see that is like so. And then the second partial velocity of P1 and N is zero. There's no U2 in the uh, velocity of P1. And then we'll have the first partial velocity of P2. 
which will be the same as B1. And then finally, the second partial velocity of P2, which will be L C2 in X plus S2 in Y. All right. All right, so those are our partial velocities. Um, we can now um, write the resultant forces on P1 and P2. All right, so these are the generalized, uh, to help form the generalized active forces. All we have that are uh, contributing forces are going to be gravity in the negative in y direction, and that's going to be the same magnitude on both particles. And then our R star for P1, uh, these are the inertial forces for P1 and P2, will be M uh, minus M times the acceleration of P1 and N, and then similarly the acceleration of P2 and N. Right? So pretty straightforward, we just have a planar system, we only have particles, so we're going to only have to deal uh, with these simple definitions. And we can form our equations of motion uh, as always. We'll have an F1, uh, right? That's the partial velocity P1 and N dotted with the active force on P1, contributing force on P1, and then um, partial velocity of P2 and N dotted with are acting on two and then similarly we have the uh, second generalized active force here and we form those by dotting with the second partial velocity partial velocities associated with u2 All right, if you take a look, um, we've got only these n, y components, so we'll just take the n, y components um, for both of these, and um, if we do those, we'll get the result will be 2 mgl sine of q1 and um, minus mgl sine of q2 there for the generalized vector forces. Similarly, we can work out our generalized inertia forces. So we got one for the first generalized speed. And these are dotted with the R star terms for each of the particles. like so. So F1, if you work uh, all that out from what we wrote before, it should look something like this. line so another minus and then a m l sine 1 l u1 dot uh, s1 plus l u1 squared c1 all right 
So just for the simple pendulum, I, it, uh, this term gets pretty nasty, so that's why we um, use these methods to keep things uh, controllable. But um, that's the basic equation for the F1 star, and you could simplify that some trigonometrically if you want. And then uh, F2 star is going to be the using the partial velocities with respect to U2. Yeah, and then I'll just write that one out, and you can check my math for me. Okay, I believe that's it there. So we've got now, um, we've got the equations of motion of the system, and we haven't done anything special. Um, and uh, and that's fine. We can use these, we can integrate the system, uh, simulate it, whatever we want to do. Uh, but we now want to figure out how can we expose a non-contributing force, right? So I'm going to propose that we look at what uh, these are just two uh, point systems so all of the forces are going to act along the um, uh, these bars of, of length L so we'll have some kind of distance forces that, that keep uh, M stuck to M and then it, and then P1 stuck back to the point zero and I want to see well what is the tension force that keeps P1 uh, stuck back to point zero here Right. So we're gonna find out what is the tension force in the member L is is uh, or, sorry, or the the member from O to P1. Okay. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we've got our equations of motion, and um, and that's all good. We'll use those in the process. Um, but what we're gonna do now is introduce an auxiliary generalized speed in the direction of the force that we want to know. So I'm going to draw the pendulum again. And then I'm going to cut the pendulum here at the joint P1. And then I'm going to draw the equal and opposite forces that would keep the point P1 in place. All right, so we're going to call this P1. So if I were to cut this and separate the two, um, then I'll have some force equal and opposite with the magnitude to T that is keeping P1 stuck to the bar L, right? And um, And then I'll draw the rest of the pendulum as I did before, like so, P2 there, okay? So we basically um, are looking for this force T, and how we're gonna make this, uh, imagine this, is that um, we're gonna give P1 a speed Right or a velocity that's a function of new auxiliary generalized speeds in the direction of the force that you want to know without introducing a new generalized coordinate. So if I were to, if P1 was that, would actually separate uh, from this bar L, it would have we'd have to introduce a generalized coordinate to map its distance here, but. Um, we're not going to introduce a generalized coordinate, but we're going to pretend that 
in fact it does um, move away at some uh, new speed relative to its prior location. So I'm going to indicate this with a uh, little arrow here that we're going to call this a, U, a speed u3 in the direction along the length of that first member in the same direction as the uh, force t. Um, okay, so these, uh, let's see if I can do this. So we're really going to look at the coupling between these two elements here. We've got this force acting to pull P1 back. And if I imagine that it has some uh, velocity that separates it, and I give it a generalized speed to capture that, but no new generalized coordinate, then this U3 is in the same or in the opposite direction as the component T, but it is aligned with that unknown force that we want. Okay, So this motion here, we're going to have some partial velocities associated with this new U3. And uh, if I dot them, then with this force, I will get some equations that have that force in it. right? And if you recall, um, because we don't have any motion of these points in general, uh, when we dot them with that to form the generalized active forces, they will uh, not contribute to the generalized active forces. So we're basically forcing it to contribute to a generalized active force here by assuming some fictitious motion, u3, and u3 is actually equal to zero, but we will introduce a u3, pretend it's not zero at first, um, and uh, work through our equations like we normally do, um, include this velocity, for, figure out our generalized active forces and our generalized inertia forces, and um, and it's going to force, it's going to uh, uh, cause this force to appear an equation. We're going to get one new equation. All right, so that's the basic premise. Okay, so the next step is to write the velocity of P1 that now includes this U3 component. All right. So we will um, now rewrite the velocity of P1 in N, and I'm going to put a little super uh, subscript A there to indicate this is for uh, including an auxiliary speed. And we would have the same velocity that we had before. But now we'll have this U3 component. And if I write it in terms of the n unit vectors, it would like, look like that. Okay. And then I'm going to write also for P2 an auxiliary speed. And it's an auxiliary speed because it's a function of P1, the velocity of P1 in A, which includes U3. And then I'll add um, the same elements here. And notice that we haven't introduced a new generalized speed, so, uh, sorry, a new generalized coordinate. So there is no other change to the velocity uh, other than adding this uh, U3 component uh, here. Okay. So, um, okay, so we've written the two velocities like so. And we're not going to change anything about the partial velocities that we've had before because we've already figured out the equations of motion. Nothing changes about them. But we are going to introduce um, some new partial velocities associated with our auxiliary generalized speed. So I'm going to have a V3 P1. And that would look like so. All right. And then uh, one for particle to associate with the U3. And that's going to end up being the exact same thing. All right, so we just create new partial velocities here associated with this motion that we've introduced. It's this fictitious motion. 
And these two partial velocities we will use now to calculate a new generalized active force and a new generalized inertia force. Um, to do so, we're going to augment our uh, resultant forces, right? This resultant force that acts on P1, and I'm going to put a subscript A there to know that it's uh, tied to this auxiliary speed. Um, we have uh, a T that is acting on this in addition to the contributing force of MG. So I'll say MG in the NY. All right, we know that's acting on, on that particle. And we also have this uh, tension force it's acting in this direction. All right, so I include that. Um, we also will look at P2, but this one doesn't change. It is only Mg and Y. We don't have any additional forces uh, of, that we're trying to expose acting on P2. So we only include uh, right here this um, tension force uh, looking at that particle P1 we've got mg and T acting on on that and uh, and we add that into the resultant for our active force okay now we introduce a new generalized active force associated with u3 which would be V three P one in the end dotted with this new resultant force, right? That includes this uh, force T that we're trying to expose, and then V three P two and in dotted with R A P two. Okay. If we work this out, um, we've got this term here dotted with this term and if you do the math there um, you'll see that we get for the first uh, portion here mg uh, cosine of q1 minus t and then this uh, second term will give us an mg cosine 1 and then that's simply 2 mg cosine 1 cosine q1 minus t Right, so now you see that in our generalized active force, we end up with this T term in here because it's in the same direction as the partial velocities of P1 um, for the U3 component. So we end up with that present. All right, and then here, I guess another thing to point out, right, we used the auxiliary partial velocities and these modified um, active forces, resultants that are acting on the particles that include T. But for um, our F, our star term associated with U3, we uh, still use the partial velocities, the auxiliary partial velocities here, but the um, resultant inertia forces will not change. We'll use those um, as is because U3 is actually zero, so U3 dot will also be zero. Uh, we don't need to introduce uh, U3 or U3 dot into the R star term because we would just replace those with zero anyways uh, in, the, in the end and they won't change um, and that won't change the result of the calculation. So the way this one looks right is V3 P1 and we use our prior R star and V3 P2 dotted with R star P2. So this is going to give us the um, these inertial force contributions in the direction of U3 that we'll then associate with this new equation we're building. All right, so these um, are a little long. If we I'll write those out though. The first component is um, just going to be L in U1 squared, right? This centripetal uh, effect there. And then that second component here will be L M S1 uh, sine 
of q1 sine of q2 plus cosine q1 cosine q2 u squared u2 squared and then plus lm u1 squared yeah okay we now have an FR and a FR star for the third generalized coordinate. If we sum these, they must equal to zero. And if you do so and do some simplification, you'll see that you can write this term. All right, so we get this equation here, and you can solve for t, in fact, and it's just this portion, All right? So in that case, I can, I can solve directly for t, and we can see that uh, this tension force, right, is a function of, um, like there's a gravitational component here, uh, there is a um, this two times this centripetal type component from the er, uh, first generalized speed and then we've got these two pieces that are associated with the I guess the centripetal and did I miss did I get everything there LM sine Q2 oh yeah U I don't have a U2 dot supposed to be a U dot there. So this is a centripetal uh, type of component that's tied to both of the angles and then this is a tangential type of component too uh, with that u2 dot component there. But anyways we, we get an equation now for that unknown force T. It's a function of in our case um, it's some function of u2 dot, u1, u2, q1, and q2, all of these time varying components there. In general, if you find a non contributing force, it could be a, a function of all the coordinates, generalized speeds, and their time derivatives, but in this case, it's only a function of u2. Raise that up there. Yeah. And then if we were to write out f1 plus f, uh, f f1 plus f star 1, right, and f2 plus f1 star, right, these um, we've already figured them out without ever considering that, that non contributing force t. And they are generally a force of u1 dot, u2 dot u1, u2, q1, q2, and, and possibly time, right? And similarly for the, uh, uh, this one. So these are gonna be functions of only the q's, the u's, and the time derivatives of the u's. And then our auxiliary equation that we've introduced allows us to in general build an equation that will include whatever non-contributing force that we're interested in, right? So this will have that extra t there. We've got uh, three equations in our case, two u dots and one t. And notice that uh, the t will not appear in the first two equations. So 
These are independent of the non-contributing forces. So we've just added this extra equation that does depend on the u dots. And um, you can write those equations too in a form that looks something like this. So if I introduce a, a coefficient, linear coefficient matrix MA, then you have u1 dot, u2 dot, and then I can put t there, plus some vector ga, all equals to zero. And this ma is really, we have the dynamical differential equations that we figured out before. And we only have, we have two uh, u dots here, so this thing will be a two by two, right? And then we'll have no dependency on T, uh, the third component. But then we'll have uh, here an M A term for U one dot in general and an M A term for U two dot and an M A term for that, that, that uh, non-contributing force. So um, in our case, there was no U one dot present so that will end up be a zero but in, in general you'll have a you know fully populated uh, entries here for that those equations associated with the non-contributing forces and then your dynamical differential equations so are untouched they're the same as what you would find out if we uh, were not trying to figure out these non-contributing forces but you can solve this uh, system um, to end up with um, equations for t and the two u dots only in functions of the q's and the u's right if you would like or you can um, simulate the system find out what the u dots uh, are and then use your equation like we have here for t right? as long as i know what u2 dot as, as well as all the others versus time then i can tell you what t is okay so that's the basic idea of exposing these non-contributing forces. So you introduce some motion, it's a fictitious motion, U3 is actually equal to zero, but we introduce a variable for that. We let the motion occur in the direction that we're interested in exposing this non-contributing force. We draw a free body diagram that has the correct forces uh, listed. And then we introduce new partial velocities associated with this uh, motion based on adding it to uh, the velocity expressions. We also augment our contributing force equations to have these non-contributing elements in them. And then when you do the dot products in your uh, FR calculation, your generalized active forces, you'll get some expressions that have these forces, uh, force magnitudes present. You also have to then balance that with the inertial forces. So you have to dot those against these new auxiliary partial velocities. And then you should get some equations that uh, can be solved to find out what these unknown forces are. And they'll be linear in those, fo those force magnitudes. And you add them as these auxiliary equations of motion. Um, and then, but nicely there, you won't find, uh, it doesn't corrupt your original uh, equations of motion with any of the non-contributing forces, but you can add as many as you want to figure out any of the remaining forces that you want to do, and you can solve this new system uh, if you'd like uh, to find out what those forces are. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about today. You can see in the online notes, I uh, worked on an example and how we solve for those, and then you'll have to do that in your homework. Awesome.